How important is this, uh, uh, Nader? We keep on calling it a, st it a stimulus package, but it's really just to keep things afloat, a, a form of essentially of uh, first aid with a patient. Yeah, it is. It is um, just keeping things afloat. Uh, but um, at the same time, I don't see um, having fiscal bill passed before the election to be of uh, critical importance for the market and for U.S. growth, uh, for that matter. The analysis that I have seen, uh, companies have plenty of cash flows, um, plenty of buffer uh, to keep them afloat for at least six months uh, from this time. And the numbers that are coming out of the U.S. in terms of uh, payroll claims, in terms of uh, well, the manufacturing surveys in particular, uh, they, they look quite solid. Uh, we do need the fiscal po policy to be, you know, the, the uncertainty to go away and to be approved. Um, but I don't think this is detrimental to the market and, and U.S. growth, for, for that matter, if it's delayed. And I really doubt anything will be approved before the election. It's seems very close. So, Nader, having said that, what's been priced in by the market? What hasn't? When you look uh, at the performance of stay home versus um, uh, work, uh, just back to work, um, and you just create those two baskets, uh, what's priced in the market is just like we're going to be staying home for a long time. Uh, but when you look at the uh, potential for um, better ways to treat uh, corona, and also a potential for some good news on the vaccine front. Um, a lot of those areas of the market are actually priced in for, or the areas of the market cyclically exposed uh, areas, I just haven't priced any of that in. Uh, you look at energy, for example, I don't think energy is priced in any much growth at all. Uh, most energy companies are just trading the same prices of where oil price was negative. Uh, you look at financials, same thing. Financials are just priced in for um, you know, COVID to continue wrecking havoc in, in U.S. growth and global growth, for that matter, for the next two, three years. Um, and at the same time, you look at some of those big tech or uh, work-at-home stocks uh, going through the roof. So there's a lot of divergences in the market, and I think there's some convergence, convergence is, is, um, is looming. Like you pointed out, it does seem like even with stimulus, the economic uh, recovery will be uh, long and labored. Would it be fair to say that in the coming year, stocks will struggle? How do you position for that? Absolutely. At a very high level, stocks will struggle. We've had strong gains um, and valuations, uh, especially in the U.S., are not attractive. So how to position it for the coming year or so is first of all to just going down below those benchmark indices. Most, uh, like look at global equities has over 60% US and 30%, 25, 30% of US is tech stocks. We really got to go down and position in those cheap and forgotten areas of the market that no one's actually paid attention to. Uh, like I said, areas like energy, global energy, global uh, material resources and, and industrial areas. And also look for opportunities outside the U.S. U.S. equity is by far the most expensive equity market in the world. There's opportunities across Asia um, where currencies are cheap. And also there's a lot of uh, pockets of great valuation in the sector. So I'll be out of U.S. and out of tech. Nader, we'll come to outside the U.S. Uh, after the break. I just want to get your call on oil at the moment. I, I mean, with the, the debate last week, of course, uh, between uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, Certainly, a Biden did come out and say that he wanted to see a move away from fossil fuels, and that certainly could be a fly in the ointment in new investment strategy, should he win. Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons energy prices actually pricing a Biden win, a landslide victory. Uh, but you look at the uh, energy, uh, it's like two, almost 2-3% two, of U.S. market cap now. Uh, you look at mergers and acquisitions that are going on in that area, and the amount of dividend cuts. Uh, when I look at history, historically, when you get that kind of uh, consolidation, when you get that kind of huge cutback on dividends, on a, from a contrarian point of view, is usually the lows uh, in the market. And when you look at oil as well, it's not that we've all of a sudden transitioned to clean energy and we just flick the switch off, we don't need oil anymore. A lot of oil, oil is just like you look at um, aviation industry, uses a huge amount of fossil fuel. And you look at what happened in China, 
back to normal. GDP came back all the way up to pre-COVID levels. Uh, what happens is the rest of the world starts going that direction. And with no investment having taken place in oil and, and, and you know, uh, production and capex in the energy sector, the market will be very tight. It will be a very tight market for oil prices that will put pressure, upside pressure in oil price. And that, for that matter, it would be very positive for energy sector, which is probably the most hated sector in the world right now. Nada, of course, a big week for China. We're talking about the next five years, the next 15 years even for you. I want to bring up this question of the day from our MLive team. Uh, what China policy matters most to the markets? What are you looking out for? It, 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 first of all, uh, it, growth friendly policy that includes um, uh, fiscal and monetary spending. Um, and uh, obviously, previous times, uh, most Chinese policy has been around uh, spending on infrastructure, railways, and building roads to nowhere. Whereas this time, uh, the focus will be on you know, the productivity of any policy, and in particular, Chinese consumer. Um, if Chinese consumers are feeling safe, selfie, uh, uh, well, uh, safety nets improve and Chinese uh, consumers start spending, that's good news for China and it's good news for the rest of the world. And that's what China wants as well. They, don't, they want to cut back on the reliance on exports and rely on the consumer. Um, so any policy that supports the consumer and spending in China uh, will be taken positively by the market. Do you see the plenum giving that support to Chinese assets? Because today we're seeing uh, Chinese stocks are down. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's right. So, you know, one of those things you just uh, buy the rumor and sell the news. So, the Chinese share market has been running ahead, ahead of this. Uh, but as long as Chinese policy is firmly um, in, on, on towards growth, um, and they do have the ammunition to actually do that. Lots of fiscal power and lots of monetary policy power, given how strong uh, renminbi has been so far. So there's a lot of room for the uh, PBOC to cut rates. Today it has been weak. Again, so one of those like, knee-jerk reactions, sell the news. But I think broadly, uh, China is actually very well placed for um, great asset market performance, whether it be Chinese bonds or Chinese equities. Uh, for, the, for the year to come. They have come out of this COVID better, than, better shape than anyone else. And um, they have a lot more room uh, and resources to spend. Nader, also, don't forget the yuan. I mean, uh, the continued strength there for, for their currency. And, uh, of course, some of that is down to a weaker dollar, but uh, some of it based on fundamentals. How does um, the, the dollar and how does the yuan really fit into what you are advising and doing? That's right. I mean, if, if uh, Chinese policy was again focused around just all exports, uh, the strength in yuan would have been a problem for them. Um, and as you mentioned, yuan strengthening because the fundamentals, local, strong fundamentals locally. Uh, but from my point of view, it also gives the PBOC lots of room to cut rates, and that probably will do that um, when um, when you have monetary policy strong strength in yuan and potential for uh, lots of for further uh, interest rate cuts that could actually bring the yuan uh, lower. But either way, uh, it, it's growth differentials. Chinese growth has been a lot stronger than the U.S. and has been putting upward pressure on the yuan. And that probably would be met by uh, some interest rate cuts by the PBOC. Nader, let's not also uh, forget that we do have uh, perhaps and arguably this idea of dual circulation, which is this concentration, as you've alluded to, of uh, the domestic economy in China looking ahead. Uh, but this also comes at a time when we may have seen peak globalization behind us, and that must mean a rejigging of supply uh, chains. Uh, how do you look at that? That is absolutely, and that's, that's got massive implications on the macro and in particular inflation. So China has been the, you know, the factory of the world and now uh, they want to become more of a uh, market for the world, you know, bring capital in the financial sector as opposed to just have more factories. And that shorter supply chains, as you mentioned, uh, the reduced reliance on everything being made in China, uh, that would mean uh, some manufacturing will leave China. Uh, and China for that matter is actually not cheap anymore to uh, have low value add manufacturing. Some of that is moving to other part of Asia. And that's another reason for Chinese authorities to just really uh, push hard on 
reorienting the growth story towards consumers. Um, but again, so it, it, it is dual because they can't drop one and just uh, back to consumer all the way. It's important to keep that, that over time for the next 10 years, uh, China will be, you know, less, less than goods will be manufactured in China. Some will be made in Mexico, Vietnam and others. Uh, but by then, you think that you know China, Chinese economy has would have rebalanced a lot, a lot more than what it has right now.